Right, so in the last video we briefly touched on diet because we were looking into the fundamentals of fitness. So in this video I'm going to expand more on the common questions and the biggest value gains that you can get from focusing on your diet. I want to focus here on things that actually grow corn, the things you're actually going to come away with something that you can implement and see noticeable differences. I'm going to show you why I do what I do and the meta-analyses that back up what I say. So in this video I'm going to tell you when I decide to gain or lose, how I manage my calories and the strategies I use to make sure that I'm staying on track for my gain or lose and also the amount of protein that I consume and why right so point number one gain or lose you get the typical questions of you know I'm skinny fat I'm underweight I'm overweight or I feel like I'm in a good body fat percentage what should I do about that how can I improve or should I just you know stay at maintenance do resistance training and somehow magically turn my fat into muscle which it's somewhat possible if you're a complete noob, but it's far from optimal. I think to really understand this, you just have to look at one chart. And it comes from this meta-analysis here of body fat and the risk of all-cause mortality. This meta-analysis is pretty broad. It covered 923,000 people. So there was a lot of data that went into this, multiple studies, 35 as you can see here. And the main takeaway is what you would expect, that unhealthy body fat percentages lead to a higher all-cause mortality. You are more likely to die younger if you're in an unhealthy range. And the way you got a picture of this, if you imagine along the x-axis we have body fat percentage, so down here being 0%, up here being, you wouldn't get to 100%, but let's say 50 or 60, and then we have optimal health. It looks something like this, which I don't think most people expect, right? But you're leaning mostly between two positions, and that's 12 and 20%, and actually it wouldn't be this like broader curve. Imagine that, there we go, it looks more like that, right? Yeah, that articulates it. So you want to be in this range for your health benefits. Below 12% and your testosterone falls off a cliff. Um, your body starts eating your organs. It's not pretty. And above, you're doing the opposite. You're drowning your organs <laughs> in fat and you're taking years off your life. So the question is, where are you on this graph? And obviously, if you're right of 20%, you need to start losing weight. And if you're left of 12%, you need to start gaining weight. Where are you on the graph? For the intents and purposes of deciding whether to gain or lose, something like this is quite useful because you could probably compare yourself to 20% here and think, hmm, am I above? Or for 10%, if you imagine 12% is halfway, halfway between these two guys, are you somewhere down here? It's going to be a little bit more nuanced than that because these are broad set people with muscle, so you want to find someone similar. If you type in body fat visualization online, you'll find hundreds of pictures of uh, different size people, for example. A skinny person is still going to look like... You're going to notice that the fat isn't on them as much. But obviously, if you're very skinny and untrained, you're not going to have this development in your arms, chest. You'd be a lot more rectangular as opposed to the Dorito that this guy's got going on. And then from that assessment, you can pretty reliably find your way to between 12 and 20%. And that should be the goal. Like, if you're outside of that range, that's where we're headed. But how'd you get there? It's calories. So again, I had another look at a meta-analysis for this, and there are studies that talk about how many calories to gain, how many calories to lose. I'm going to get into that more specifically, how I make those decisions. But I thought what was more important is actually to say how much of an impact counting calories will have. So I think the reason I've been able to really keep the kind of body that I want for the past three, four years is I've been pretty religious with calorie tracking. And it's not that I'm so obsessive that when I'm going out, I'm counting every pint or every meal out that I have. But whenever I learn a new recipe that I'm going to make regularly, I'll do the calories maybe once or twice, because how many meals do you actually make that are different? Maybe like five or six? You know, I, I like chicken pasta pesto. I like burgers. And I'll work out how many calories I can have per meal. And then, okay, right, I can have 500 calories a meal, what does 500 calories of chicken pasta pesto in my recipe look like? And then I don't ever really have to think about it because I know the ingredients for what I normally make. So the majority of my food, I don't have to think about. And what this study looked into was self-monitoring through calorie tracking versus not self-tracking. And basically the group that actually just went by feeling of hunger and being aware that they wanted to be on a diet and choosing healthier options just did a completely shit job in comparison to the, to the people that were actually counting calories. And it makes sense. You're measuring it. You're not guessing. You can't be putting on weight if your body's using up all the energy that it puts in. Use my fitness pal. When you log in and you set up, you put in your height and your weight and your age, and you're gonna tell it you're sedentary because the chances are you're not training for like a marathon. And it'll tell you, okay, moderate weight gain. Here's how many calories you need. It's probably gonna be 
400 calories above your maintenance. And if you want to lose weight, it'll be the same in the opposite direction. And what your goal is, is to get yourself down to between 12 and 20%. Now, once you get there, what do we do then? That's the, that's the fun question, because then you're in, you're in the world of starting to look more like these, these guys over here. Because you might get down to 12% body fat, but you don't have half as much muscle. Well, it's quite simple. You've probably heard of bulking and cutting, right? What you do is imagine our body fat is between 12 and 20%. You bulk up to 20 and then you cut back down to 12 and you bulk up to 20 and you cut back down to 12. What happens is that while you're bulking, you're gaining muscle and fat, right? But this line is going to represent, this line is going to represent your muscle mass, right? So while you're bulking, your muscle goes up. But then when you cut, if you're getting enough protein and you're exercising, like I described in the foundations video, but also I will go more into how you can periodize your training for this kind of structure in my next video. While you're cutting, you're going to lose the fat and your muscle is going to hopefully stay around the same. You're going to lose some, but you're not going to lose as much as you lose fat. And then the next time you bulk again, you gain the muscle. Right? And it's this stepping system of you cycling between high body fat, low body fat. You're gaining weight, you're losing weight. Every time that you gain weight, you gain more muscle. And every time you lose weight, you're losing the fat, keeping most of the muscle. And that's how you end up looking like these guys. So what you do is, okay, we cut down to 12% body fat. We're doing our resistance training. So we do a, a gradual weight gain. We tell my fitness pal, hey, my new girl, I want to gain weight. So we gain weight until we reach 20, slowly, very slowly. And while we're doing our resistance training, we're noticing that because we're eating more, we're suddenly able to lift more heavy weights. And then eventually you get to that threshold. You look at yourself and you go, oh, I've put on a bit of fat, but I'm looking more muscular. So then you spend four to six weeks, maybe longer, losing that fat and the muscle sticks around. And next time you hit 12%, you look nice and skinny again, except you've built a bit of muscle on top. And every time you do that cycle, there's a bit more muscle. And that's what there is to it. But what you want to do to make sure that we're not losing muscle and we're gaining as much muscle as possible is make sure we're getting enough protein. Now, we've got another nice meta-analysis here that covered 49 studies, so quite a bit of breadth. And they have this fantastic number here. If you look on your packets of food, you have the nutritional breakdown and you have the little percentages that tell you, okay, this food is X percent of how much you need to eat for a day. Well, the recommended daily allowance for protein for grams per kilogram of body weight. So if you're an 80 kilogram male, they would recommend 0.8 grams. So it'd be what, like 70, 65 something grams of protein, right? That is not the optimal amount of protein for gaining and maintaining your muscle because what you don't want to do is not give your body the construction material that allows it to build and then hold on to your muscles while you're cutting because otherwise what your what your graph's going to look like is you'll be doing your bulking and cutting and because you haven't got enough protein you're not going to gain as much and then when you lose weight you lose the muscle as well and then you gain you gain a little bit of muscle because you're not giving your body what it needs and then when you cut again it doesn't have the components to hold on to the muscle and you lose it again and you stay looking exactly how you started and you just lose months of progress without seeing the improvements that you want to see. Now, this is also possible if you're not managing your calories correctly. So if you find that you're not actually gaining up to these weights and you're thinking, cool, I've been I've been bulking for two, three months now and well, <laughs> the weight's not going up on the scales, then whatever my fitness power is giving you isn't enough your body might be resistant, everybody's different, just up your calories. Or if you're trying to lose weight, up your deficit. Be sceptical of RDAs. Look into optimal, because fundamentally, do you want to be giving your body the bare minimum so that you don't get sick, or do you want to be giving yourself what it actually needs to thrive? I always make my decisions based on this, what's optimal? As long as the cost isn't to the point that, you know, it's not worth it. If I could gain an extra two years of life, but it requires me to spend 10 years meditating, then I would see that as a net negative, right? That's not to say don't meditate. I do meditate. I'm just saying I wouldn't spend 10 years straight meditating to put an extra two years of life on the end. Now, it also says here about timing and type, but I'll get onto that in the next diet video. That is part of the roadmap. We'll get that. Now, I think what's crazy about this is that we haven't really got into much complexity here, but these are some of the highest yield differences that you can make because if you're getting yourself down to the 12 to 20% body fat range, you're going to feel healthy, like I said, because it literally lower all-cause mortality. If you're progressively building up your muscle, look better, feel better, have more energy, 
it's going to be a great time. And if you're eating more protein, then you're going to notice it when you're in the gym, when you're lifting things, it's going to be easier because you're actually giving your body what it needs to do that. These are the highest yield strategies that I use that I've noticed have pushed up my gains. Right, so you might have been wondering through that what this has to do with software engineers. Well, I've actually got a side project going on at the minute where I'm going to take this advice and package it into a free website that won't look anything like this, but will contain some of these elements. And what this is doing is I've given it my height, weight and body fat percentage, and it's going to adjust recipes based on whether you should be in a calorie deficit or a cal calorie surplus to get you into the 12 to 20 percent body fat range and then it's going to have a more optimized cycle where it gets you into a slow bulk maintenance phase to let your muscles recover mini cut phase where it's going to more aggressively bring your calories down so that it's more time efficient to get you towards your muscle goals but this is a very early prototype but it takes for thinking out of it it means that you won't have to think about your calories because this is going to handle it for you and you won't have to think about your shopping list because this is going to give it to you and as long as you stick to the recipes you're going to find yourself just following that tracking it takes the thinking out of it so if you'd be interested in this app i'm going to leave a link to my newsletter beneath and i'll send you an email when i release it and like i said all of the functionality i've just mentioned will be completely free and it'll also show you progress over time but otherwise i'm going to continue on this series and if you're looking for something a bit different but actually covers how i fit my fitness into my schedule i have this video here how i manage my time as a software engineer where i actually break down what my day looks like how i optimize for getting my work done, getting enough fitness in day to day and also having spare time while also making content for this and writing the app. So hopefully you find that video interesting. Cheers.